I'm glad to give you a short introduction um, how we in Claren uh, are dealing and have been dealing with the FAIR principles. And actually, as Francisca already mentioned, it's a kind of interesting exercise since uh, at the time when um, Claren was conceived, the FAIR principles were not yet out there. And in a way, in many aspects, as you will see today, um, in, in a way, we've been um, being compliant with the FAIR principles um, from our vision of making uh, Claren um, a place where someone can uh, really um, see so-called e-science in action. So really this interoperability of the data, of the tools, making sure that reuse is possible. And since that was in our DNA, so to say, um, we found out also going through all the individual FAIR requirements that were actually pretty much um, in line with the uh, ideas behind uh, FAIR. Good, before going into this kind of um, overview of how FAIR compliant we are, I'll give a short introduction on how Claren is actually working, how we have set up our technical architecture, uh, since that will help later on to explain uh, in which sense we are FAIR compliant and where maybe there, there, there's not com uh, compliancy. So, Claren um, is a distributed architecture. Uh, we don't have one big single computing center where everything is being done. No, on the other hand, we're making use of these so-called centers yeah, where um, all kinds of universities, academic institutions, research institutions are providing access to data and to tools. Um, in the case of data, and uh, it's mostly uh, HTTP accessible files that are provided through repositories. For the tools, uh, we're talking about uh, web applications, web services, also standalone tools. And these are spread all over Europe. Uh, the nodes in this network, uh, we're, we call them centers. There's a kind of classification of different types of centers. And in this talk today, I'll be mostly focusing on our so-called B centers. That are the centers which are providing either tools or data and which have been going through a certification process. Certification process in order to see whether these centers are really compliant with the requirements which we have. And as you will see, these requirements tie in very much uh, to the ideas behind FAIR. Good, so what is at the core of such a Clarin uh, center? Uh, it's basically a repository. Um, a repository which contains metadata, description about either the language data or the language tools which are available at such a center. Language data, as Francisca already mentioned, can be quite wide. It's, it's about uh, single texts, recordings, large corpora. It could be a newspaper corpus, but also uh, some medieval charters uh, that are digitized and that are available. Lexica, WordNet, grammars, etc., etc. It's a very broad um, selection, so to say. Um, also, these kind of um, resources hang very much together with the specialization of the center. So we do have some centers which are specialized, say, in, in speech. Uh, there are other centers which are specialized specialized in, in uh, um, medieval text, for instance. So there's a, this kind of natural speci specialization and the, the strength of this network is that you bring together all the knowledge, all the resources from those backgrounds. On the other hand, as I already mentioned, there are the tools. Uh, th technically, that can be web applications, uh, something that you can just run in your browser. Also web services, which you can address as a, a programmer and wh where you can um, basically ask to, to, to be sent the, the, the output of a, a processing process. There are all kinds of web service pipelines, so where you can put together different modules to um, analyze something and where you get, in the end, the output of that pipeline. And there are, there's also standalone <laughs> applications for certain <laughs> tools. You need to install them on your computer, either because they're, they're very interactive or um, yeah, the, the, technically they require that. So all in all, very varied landscape and the, the aim of Clarence is bringing this together, making it compatible. How are we doing that? Um, well, first of all, um, there's a very important role in our infrastructure for metadata. Um, the idea is that every tool or every data set is described with a metadata record. The metadata should always be open. So that means that centrally we can harvest the metadata record which are uh, the metadata records which are provided through the Clarence centers. So uh, we can put it at one computer, we can index it, we can process it um, efficiently from there. That's basically also what we're doing. So currently, just to give you a kind of an idea, we're harvesting about one million metadata records uh, from all the Clarence centers, also from uh, partners with whom we're collaborating. For instance, Europeana is also providing metadata for its resources. So the idea is that we have one good starting point where all the data is registered through the metadata. 
Then in the next step, what is possible is to uh, basically index the metadata to make it searchable, to make it possible for people to explore what is in there. If you are interested in uh, 20th century Polish novels, it should be possible with one interface to search for that and to identify the data sets which are relevant for your purpose. That is possible through um, a search application which we call Virtual Language Observatory and which is basically a kind of index of all the metadata records. Um, now, as a next step, it is also possible, after you have identified those Polish novels, to search for matching applications to process them. So say you want to do named entity recognition or um, uh, in case you have a speech file you might be interested in, in automatic speech recognition, then it is possible um, to basically detect all the tools which are um, which can process the, the resource that you've selected. And then in the next step, um, this data analysis can be made. So basically, again, relying on the, um, on the tools which are available through the Claren infrastructure, and, uh, basing this kind of matching on the metadata which is provided, giving you the possibility of execute named entity recognition on the uh, Polish novel that you have found out. Good. Um, this might seem very obvious when you look at it from the high uh, level uh, perspective, but in practice it's a lot of hard work to tie all these components together, of course. That's not visible in this architecture, but going through the requirements which we have for the sentence, we will see uh, all the kind of, of, of nitty gritty details that you have to make sure are in place before such a tight integration is possible. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind, that it's really hard work to make all these things interoperable, but thanks to, um, among others, the FAIR principles, it is possible to achieve such a scenario. Um, good. Something else about the uh, data architecture. Um, sometimes it is not possible um, to basically uh, uh, search um, through everything in a central fashion. Uh, as we have seen for the metadata, it was possible to make a copy of all the metadata, index it and make it searchable. That's not always the case for the really the, the, the content data sets. Uh, that could be either for uh, the, the, the mere size. Yeah, you, you cannot just copy all the data sets that are around in Europe. Uh, it could be for copyright reasons. Uh, certain centers are providing um, uh, large corpora, for instance, of, of newspapers or of, ma or of magazines which are still under copyright and they simply cannot uh, just provide them. And um, uh, and, and sometimes also for, for, for uh, technical reasons, uh, it's not always possible to basically just make a copy of everything and then index it centrally. So for those uh, data sets, we've also come up with the idea of so-called federated content search, where basically instead of doing central indexation, we're basically sending queries to the individual centers providing data sets, and then they are sending back answers to those queries. And then with a centralized interface, it's possible to at least discover where a relevant data set uh, by searching in the, in the data itself is um, accessible. And then in the next step as a researcher, once you've found that there could be an interesting corpus uh, of, of Latvian on, on one specific Claren center, then you can jump to that center and use the more specialized search tools uh, on that place to, to basically dive into the details. Um, okay, good. Something else about the data architecture, and that is about um, persistent identifiers. So one of our requirements for uh, each uh, Claren uh, center is to have persistent identifiers. Persistent identifiers, um, identifiers that are accessible for a longer time. Also when, uh, say, technically a resource is moved to another server, to another location, the identifier stays consistent and it's still possible to access the data set behind that. We have persistent identifiers pointing to different objects. So first of all, each metadata record has a persistent identifier, making it possible to cite the metadata record, the starting point towards the data. The metadata itself also contains a self-reference. That's very important since after the harvesting, otherwise you um, you would lose um, a kind of citable access point. And now that we have centrally harvested all the metadata records, it is always possible to cite the, um, the, the, the metadata record that uh, a user has found and also to reuse it. That's a very important uh, feature. 
Next to that, we're also having persistent identifiers going to the individual data sets or to the individual tools. So you see there uh, in all kinds of places persistent identifiers, but I think it's, it's a very important feature in order to enable the, the stability and to ensure the stability of these references. Um, we're referring to the language data sets and to the language tools um, from our metadata. We have a kind of fixed header structure for that. I'll be coming back to that later. Uh, but it allows to um, type exactly to what you're pointing. So you don't, you don't simply know that uh, you're pointing to a persistent identifier, but you know exactly that you're pointing to um, a speech recording or to a landing page of, um, of a resource that, that describes how a corpus was built up. In addition to that, there's a flexible body allowing some possibilities for uh, specialized data types to have their required metadata information in there. Since there's, as I already mentioned, there's a lot of variation in the kind of tools and resources that are around. So the requirements with regards to the metadata uh, descriptions uh, can vary and one needs to cater for that. <coughs> Um, this is a bit of an uh, insight in how these metadata schemas are built up. So basically this flexible body is based on a kind of Lego bricks uh, in order to uh, enable a, data, a metadata provider to choose the uh, elements which are relevant to describe a data set. So it could be uh, things um, kind of, of, of a part of a schema relevant to describe a textual resource or maybe a multimedia resource or maybe the actors uh, say uh, when you're interviewing someone you want to record some information about the people who are being interviewed or are doing the interview that's all possible to put it in there you put together these legal bricks and then you have your personalized metadata schema still this ensures that there is um, both a, a clear link to um, definitions uh, so for each of the metadata elements, there needs to be a clear machine accessible and person uh, accessible description of what is being described. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, these, these parts are also reusable. So once you have come up with a, a metadata um, uh, description mechanism for describing uh, an interviewer, your colleague in another center who is dealing with a similar kind of data types can reuse that part of description. So uh, in that way, ensuring there's a higher degree of interoperability between these things. Um, all the metadata profiles, all the metadata components are stored in a separate uh, registry. So it is also again possible to browse through that information, both for humans and for computers, important aspect. Good, then, uh, then we're finally coming to how this ties in with the uh, FAIR principles. Uh, and I've, uh, uh, I've, I've copied here um, a diagram about uh, the so-called uh, FAIR ports, uh, these FAIR repositories, a uh, very nice uh, concept. Um, and I'll hope to give you a bit of insight in which sense, uh, through our uh, technical architecture that we've been uh, working with, we uh, are trying or we are um, FAIR uh, compliant. Maybe in certain aspects we aren't, so it's interesting for, for the discussion later on. Good, so first of all, uh, we have the findable uh, requirements. That's split up in separate sub-requirements. First one is that metadata and data are assigned a globally unique and eternally persistent identifier. Well, as you've seen, we are, require persistent identifiers for our metadata records and for the data uh, sets, so I think we're in line with that. Um, of course, there's a question, what is an eternally persistent identifier? I mean, that's a kind of philosophical discussion also, I think. But in a way, uh, through using the handle protocol, uh, we think we're basing our persistent identifiers at least on a, a very organizationally and technically sound platform. Um, if it will be, if every uh, identifier will be eternally uh, persistent, well, that's something that only the future uh, will show us. Second uh, sub-requirement is that the data are described with rich metadata. Well, we've already seen uh, the, the, the way we are modeling our metadata with this uh, component uh, approach. Uh, for sure, it's possible to provide rich metadata with that. I think one important side question which does not come up in the uh, FAIR requirements is uh, the issue of granularity. I think it's also something that many people are struggling with. We've also seen that in, in discussions with other um, infrastructure structures. Um, you can describe an, a huge collection with one metadata record, assign it a persistent identifier, and technically you're fair. Uh, 
But in practice, it might be much more useful to split it up in smaller blocks and to describe also the, the smaller sub-blocks. So that is something uh, I think there is no universal answer to, but it's definitely something to keep in mind when modeling data and metadata. Then, uh, as a third point, the, the metadata and the data need to be registered and indexed in a searchable resource. Well, for the metadata, we have this virtual language observatory. Uh, and by the way, since all this metadata is openly available, it's also possible to think of other implementations. Uh, so, for instance, EUDET is also harvesting our metadata <coughs> and exposing that through their B2Find portal. So, the importance here is that the metadata is openly available, that there are technical mechanisms to basically make a copy of the metadata and to index it yourself. That's in place. Also for the data, where possible, we have this federated content search. So it is indexed, it's searchable, and it is possible to, to basically find the resources. And then the fourth sub-requirement is uh, the need um, for the metadata to specify the data identifier. So as I mentioned, we have this part in the metadata where you can refer to a specific um, PID where a file is hosted, uh, or maybe where a landing page is available. Um, Important here, I think, is, is uh, to think about those cases where you have a metadata file which is pointing to a landing page, but without any access to the direct data. Um, obviously, sometimes that is required. Um, it's not always that, that the data itself is available under an open access license, but there are, there, there are much uh, or many gradations in that respect. Um, Maybe time is too short here to, to mention it now, but if you look at, at the examples that we've seen, um, sometimes um, you get a landing page, okay. Um, sometimes from that landing page you can directly access the resources, but also sometimes on the landing page there's, there's a kind of general procedure described on how to get access. Uh, maybe you need to write a paper letter to some researcher to get access to a specific data set. So the, the whole process starting from the landing page can be very diverse and in that respect um, the, um, the, the access to the data can sometimes be quite uh, tricky to achieve. Good, that brings us to the accessible part of FAIR mm -hmm. uh, for, and, and basically the, ac the accessible requirements uh, states that the metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized communications protocol. Split up in three sub-requirements, so I will go in every single of these. Um, so the protocol for uh, getting the access needs to be open, it should be free, and it's universally implementable. I think we're in line with that, so for the access to the resources, we are using the HTTP protocol, very open, free, uh, long-standing tradition, uh, and for um, basically resolving the access to the HTTP URLs we, we're basing on the handle protocol, same story, no problem. Then the second sub-requirement um, is that the protocol allows for an authentication and authorization procedure where necessary. And I think within our field, in the language data, it's very important to keep this in mind. We've also taken that on board since the beginning uh, of, of the existence of Clarin, since we realized that lots of uh, data sets containing uh, language material are not openly available. It could be for, for copyright reasons, it uh, could be for, for ethical reasons, uh, sometimes it's just containing very sensitive data. And think about patient-doctor interaction that is being video recorded, well then you need to obviously to be very careful with that. So in order to um, give um, researchers access to those resources, um, We've chosen for so-called um, yeah, federated login uh, based on the SAML protocol. I won't bore you with the technical details there, but the idea is that you can basically use your own institutional credentials, your account from Utrecht University, for instance, to access resources which are available in Poland uh, or, or in Germany or wherever. Um, that's for the authentication part. The authorization part remains always with the resource provider, since that is the party which has the rights on the data and also the party who can decide who should get access to the data. So um, I think as far as this requirement um, can be fulfilled, we're definitely in line with that. And then we come to the, the third sub-requirement for the accessibility, and that is the metadata need to be accessible, even when the data are no longer available. As I mentioned, all of our metadata is open, so it's definitely accessible. Um, I've put here a kind of warning about the awareness of having, um, or, or the requirement of having the metadata for data that is no longer available. So that's very much a kind of mentality thing. So the data providers need to realize that even when a data set is superseded by another one, or is maybe for 
legal reasons no longer available, um, in such cases, it's important to still keep available the metadata information so that someone who is searching for the data set can find out that it's not available any longer and maybe with a reason why it's no longer available. Um, this sounds very trivial, but it requires a really um, considerate approach from the side of the data providers. We've seen that in, in several cases, that it's really something to keep, um, to keep in mind when, when setting up your repository, thinking about the policies aligned with that. Good, then we come to the interoperability. Um, there again, there are three sub requirements. So there's a requirement for <coughs> metadata, um, for the metadata to use a formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Well, that's a lot of requirements. Um, I think we're generally in line with that, especially for the metadata. We have this kind of um, clearly defined mechanisms for, for, for describing that. Uh, we're having a whole language in this component metadata approach to describe that. Um, I think for the data we're also largely in line with that, but there of course there's much more heterogeneity. So it means that um, we don't have a full influence on every single data format which is provided through all of the clearance centers. I mentioned this one million records. These records are pointing to data sets. Uh, it's impossible for us to say okay you can only use this format or that format. So what we're trying to do there is to give kind of best practices. So people are also asking us so which format should we be using when we have video recording or maybe a, a brain scan or um, a, a, a newspaper, a digitized newspaper. And we're trying to give some advice on that, trying to use as much as possible well-documented open standards um, where possible. I mean, there are some cases, and we've seen that with uh, very specific data sets, uh, the, the neuro-linguistic brain scans, well, there sometimes you only have proprietary formats. So in that case, it's a matter of really describing that well, describing how um, someone still can, can, can use uh, that format. Second sub-requirement is that the metadata or data should use vocabularies that follow FAIR principles. So it's a tricky one since it's a, this kind of recursion, again requiring uh, access um, to, to the vocabularies. I think um, that we're as far as possible in line with that. So as I mentioned, our metadata uh, can contain vocabularies. These vocabularies are fully open, they're documented, they contain persistent identifiers to definitions of the, um, of the, the vocabulary items. And, and these persistent identifiers, again, are machine accessible and human accessible. Third requirement is to have uh, the metadata include qualified references to other metadata. And again, it's a kind of a complicated one since it says between brackets metadata, re referring to between brackets metadata. Our metadata refers to other metadata um, files. So it's possible to have these kind of hierarchies and to make kind of relations between the metadata records. The metadata also refers to the data, so you can find the data. The other way around um, is a bit more tricky since basically if you want to refer from the data to the metadata file, it might be that you need to make changes to the basically the, the, the data format itself in order to be able to include such reference. Now I checked this with the detailed descriptions and it's also possible um, to have this kind of uh, universal search mechanism uh, where you can basically enter um, the identifier of data set and then finding back the metadata set. That is something that we have in place. So through this virtual language observatory you can enter the PID of a data set and then you can find the metadata record which is attached to that. So depending a bit on how the sharp you are in interpreting this rule, I think we are more or less compliant. Um, finally, we come to the reusable. Very important, of course. I mean, since that's actually, I think, one of the major incentives for data sharing is reuse, uh, making sure that um, time is not lost on reinventing the wheels, that important data sets can be reused for re replication to have uh, uh, yeah, better science in the end. So again, this is split up in multiple sub-requirements. First one is to have uh, that the metadata should have a plurality of accurate and uh, relevant attributes. Uh, with the first one that every data set and, and the, the related metadata should have a clear and accessible data usage license. Very important thing. Um, also a tricky one especially in terms of the standardization. So uh, I've mentioned here that curation is needed. That's something that we've seen from practice. Um, even when you have relatively standardized licenses, Creative Commons, there are many variants around and people are using many ways to describe them. Even with the, uh, the, the kind of easily um, 
the, 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 the compatibility through URLs yeah, for the Creative Commons license, there are different URLs around. So in any case, um, coming up with a kind of clear data usage license, which is also easy to interpret, requires curation. And that is something which is an important task, I think also for the research infrastructures. We are actively working on that, trying to standardize on uh, sets of licenses, while keeping, keeping in mind that it's not always so easy. So sometimes a resource is bound to, um, say, an old license agreement that cannot be changed anymore. Uh, and then you just have to document that. And it might require some, some additional steps also for outsiders to understand what that license really uh, means. But it's definitely an important uh, part. The second sub-requirement there is that, uh, well, that uh, the metadata and the data are associated with their provenance. This sounds very simple. Uh, in practice, I think it's not always um, so easy to, to achieve this. So this OK, I think it depends a bit for the data set. Um, it also depends on how strict you are on the interpretation. So um, think of a large corpus, hmm, um, which is manually annotated, uh, or maybe in first instance automatically annotated, then uh, post, uh, so after this, this, this um, automatic annotation, um, post corrections have been made, and then maybe some, some uh, restructuring has been done. In such a case, you really need to describe the whole process of how that corpus or how that data set came into existence. Now, for very large professionally, organ professionally organized corpora, it's definitely possible to do that. There are uh, maybe scientific papers on that, on how that has been done. Uh, if you have smaller sets, which have been just put together uh, in terms of a specific research project and which are maybe used only once, well, actually this requirement still goes. I'm not sure if it's always really followed up in, in detail, but it's definitely something which is important to keep in mind. So to make sure that the provenance information is available up to which version of that tool have you been using, which version of the data set have you been using. Uh, what I think you can do in terms of an infrastructure is at least requiring that there's a clear versioning pol policy in place. And that is what we are actually uh, doing. Third sub requirement is that the metadata and the data needs to meet domain relevant community standards. Again, it's an obvious thing. Of course, the question is you know, what is a domain relevant standard? Uh, that's something that comes with a lot of discussion. Um, luckily, for purposes like this, we have a standards committee in place. So, that is a place where people who are experts in this field can basically discuss what is a suitable standard, what should be recommended, what is maybe not so recommended, and if it's not recommended, what an alternative could be. Important thing. Um, I think we're largely in line with that, if only since as, um, uh, as a community, uh, those people who are storing specific data sets or are providing specific tools are of course knowledgeable of what the uh, community standards are and, and what they are using. And basically it's most of the time the centers who are coming to us and basically asking, well, we're sometimes getting data sets which are stored in proprietary formats or which are really problematic. Can't you please provide some recommendations um, to, to, for instance, use open standards or this or that. So basically we're getting actively feedback from the individual centers on recommendations like this. And I think that's a kind of natural way of doing this. So that's also something which is largely uh, in line with our policies. Okay, so um, some uh, further points of attention, uh, lessons we've basically learned uh, throughout the whole endeavor. Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, you need to make sure that, um, or you need to be aware that machine accessibility requires specific uh, attention. Um, that means, for instance, that you need to have direct URLs or persistent ident identifiers to be included in the metadata. If they're not there, then you will never be able to basically reach the uh, data objects which are around there, uh, uh, let, uh, let uh, alone that you can and process them. Um, the data types need to be included, very important aspect. So for instance, at least the MIME type should be available per file. And it's important to be aware that um, just a landing page is not sufficient. I mean, if there is no machine processable URL to the data object itself, um, a landing page is nice for a human user, but it does not work when you want to have some automated processing in place. 
Secondly, um, it's important also to realize that all kind of fancy but maybe a bit idiosyncratic additions can, can make um, a repository um, yeah, really less fair uh, in that sense that, for instance, if you have a specific uh, viewer, um, it might be nice for a human user to browse through, uh, I don't know, a manuscript or some, some OCR book. Uh, but um, these viewers often kind of hide or block the direct access to the data. And if that is the case, then, uh, yeah, well, your data is basically less fair and it will also be less um, um, yeah uh, less available for automated processing um, similar situation often happens with dialogues so sometimes you have to agree with uh, the terms of use or with a license or with some other specific thing a dialogue pops up well as a user you can click that away or you can agree with that but as a machine that's not always possible or it's most often not possible so therefore dialogues also are often kind of um, yeah, um, blocking the um, the access and the fairness of the overall data. And uh, finally, uh, there's also the non-standardized uh, login workflow. So uh, suppose you have to register an account with some repository or so, uh, you, you have to provide additional information, maybe uh, sometimes uh, fill in a CAPTCHA. Uh, it can be quite tricky to, to do these kind of things and um, already for human beings, I mean, just mention the CAPTCHAs, it's quite difficult to, to recognize which characters are in there. Uh, but if of course, if you want to have something machine processable, uh, such a capture could really be a major stumble stone uh, in order to, to, to make the, yeah, the data really machine accessible. So I think these are some kind of important points to, to take home whenever you're thinking uh, about your fair data, but also about the further steps in the, in the chain like automated processing. Good, this uh, brings us to the conclusion uh, of this presentation. Uh, well, uh, first of all, of all I think um, being fair compliant um, does cost considerable effort. I mean, it does not come for free. It costs some, some additional things to think about um, and, and even more than you uh, might foresee at first sight. Uh, but uh, I think Overall, um, it helps a lot whenever you are uh, keeping the, the FAIR principles in mind uh, when designing the data architecture. Uh, to us, it helped a lot to be aware about, say, uh, machine accessibility or the, 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 the uh, reusability of data sets. Um, in the whole later process of implementing that. Uh, and I think, and that's, that's a second uh, important uh, part there, that in the end, the results uh, as measured in, in terms of the user satisfaction, but also in terms of the multiplier effects, and uh, think about all the data sets that you can connect to tools uh, and the, the richness of the, the, the whole ecosystem that comes out of that, uh, they are absolutely worth uh, the work. Um, then maybe to, to conclude, I mean, I think it's important to, to um, realize, especially with the recent vis visibility of FAIR, um, that it's, I mean, it's, it's basically it's our guiding principle. So uh, it is nor a religion, uh, nor an, an empty buzzword. It's really something you have to find your own way in. You take it uh, along as a kind of, of guiding principle, but it's not um, a, a strict law or um, specific way of thinking that you absolutely need to take up. No, it's more the principles, it's more the concept behind it, and you always need to keep in mind the, the overall uh, goal at the end of the, of the story. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, maybe there are some questions, and in any case, I would like to point you to some further documentation. Uh, there is the overview of the Clarence Centers. There is um, information about the exact requirements for the Clarence Centers. And uh, of course, there's the webpage on the uh, FAIR principles where you can read everything uh, in, uh, in great uh, detail. Thank you for your uh, attention.